Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Federico Tozzi. I'm the executive director of the Italy America Chamber of Commerce. And uh, I'm here today with our friend and member, uh, Bill D'Arianzo. Uh, Bill is an expert uh, in the field of uh, sustainability, but he's also a great marketer. He has a long career with very, in, the, in, the, in the luxury industry, and we've been working with him in the past. So we are particularly happy to have him today as a, as a speaker, but also the curator of this uh, six-part you know, webinar on sustainability. And uh, we hope that you enjoy the content. And uh, I will leave uh, the, the floor and the mic to, to Bill. Bill. Thank you, Federico, very much in the IACC. And welcome, welcome, everyone. Um, let me begin just with a broad overview. The first uh, a slide that you see uh, outlines the entire program, uh, the six modules, each of which uh, are self-contained. So today there's a theme. We're going to complete that theme about sustainability. And um, the rest of the uh, five uh, modules are continuations and extensions of the theme culminating in carbon trading and how you turn carbon, if you will, into an asset and into a monetary uh, source of revenue. So um, let's uh, get going on uh, the challenge of, uh, of what is sustainability. And um, we need to begin here with these business definitions. And, and part of what we're going to have is you know what do businesses need to know? And by the way, we've got some um, <clears throat> we've got some interesting uh, videos that any of you who are interested, please in the chat box at the end, let me know, and we'll be happy to forward these to you rather than to show them during the presentation. So the first one is by Jim Cutler, who's the CEO of TBPG, who's been really at the forefront of both capital investment and climate change. And he talks about the complexity as I will be talking about it as well in, in this session. Um, the second part of our presentation is managing sustainability. Once you understand what it is, what the challenges are, what the opportunities are, and there are many, um, how do you do it without having to change your business organization? How do you create a focus that definitely moves you in the direction of uh, engaging global sustainability opportunities without having to completely reverse the character of your business. So we'll talk about that. And again, there is uh, from uh, Paolo, uh, Professor Paolo Tatici, uh, he has a, a wonderful um, TED talk. And again, it's simply too long to present here, but we'll present it to you, we'll send it to you if this is a section of the presentation uh, today uh, that that resonates uh, with you. From there, we'll talk a little bit about the global consumer, uh, their sustainable priorities and regulators and what it takes to bring brands to market in a way, again, that's effective and that is conscious of the fact that the regulations are really, really growing uh, with leaps and bounds and we have to be cognizant of them. And finally, let's get into some of those specific ones and that will be the last uh, section uh, of our presentation uh, today. And again, we have a half hour at the end for q and I'm delighted to field any questions you might have, any inquiries. And so let's get, uh, let's get started. One of the important um, frameworks for climate change and sustainability is what the UN has done, these sustainable development goals. And you've probably heard about some of the COP uh, summits. And COP is just a shorthand uh, for conference of parties, which is really kind of diplomatic talk for when you have an ongoing set of conferences that repeat themselves. So COP is just the shorthand for conference of parties. And you've par probably heard of COP25, and we'll take a look at a few of those in a moment. What I want to point out here is that these sustainable development goals have been embraced in one way or another by over 200 uh, uh, governments uh, across the globe. And they're, they go from no poverty as, an, as a goal, number one, to partnerships 
uh, as a way to um, move things along at a brisker pace. And all of those 17, one way or another, pop up in different parts of the marketplace as priorities. So this is an important framework, not only for the global summits and understanding that this is really what determines uh, those agendas, but it also indicates the range and the scope and the differences in different markets from a business point of view, that if you're gonna enter those markets, you really have to get your arms around the differences in terms of geopolitical landscapes. All right, really quickly, let me just kind of go through this. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol was the first recognition that this is an international problem, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the second, you probably heard uh, about um, uh, the Paris, which is one of the really pivotal ones because the agreement set the 1.5 centigrade as the absolute, if you will, ceiling. We've got to be below that and it has to be done within a certain period of time. This is a legally binding international treaty, as you can see from the text here. But to be frank about it, there is no, apart from International Court of Justice, but there is no police force, there's no jail, there could be a fine, but right now those fines are not showing up here. They could show up in regulatory positions that have been violated, but that's apart from the agreement itself. That has to do with what the EU or the FTC or the SEC determines are the requirements to do business in their markets. So this is legally binding. There's a sense of, I think, moral obligation here. It's very strong. And again, uh, almost 200 parties signed on. So you get a huge number of governments and, and the NGOs and what have you are involved in this. Um, <clears throat> COP26, um, the Glasgow one, again, shows uh, how difficult it is, challenging it is. But nonetheless, progress is made not by leaps and bounds, but by short steps. The objective was to challenge whether or not uh, the use of um, coal, uh, if you will, furnaces for energy could finally be challenged and phased out. The phase out phrase was used, but at the end, both India and China uh, really stepped up and said, we'd love to sign this and absolutely determined the reduction in the scope and the character of the commitment. The final language was phase down, uh, if you will, uh, coal burning uh, plants and not phase out. So um, <laughs> we've got the, the, the problem of, of what the majority would like to do uh, faced with what the power centers want to do. But we made some progress, the issue is up, there's a consciousness of it. And uh, the next two, uh, again, one is this uh, uh, COP27, where recognize that the smaller countries that very often uh, are uh, burdened with climate change, but haven't caused it, uh, ought to be compensated in some way. And there was, in fact, and is a, a, a fund, $250 million fund that has been established by the contributing uh, country. So there's progress there as well uh, to deal uh, with the realities and the fact that if you're responsible, you ought to pay something to those who are damaged by that. And the final last one is, is COP28. And again, conversation about transition away from fossil fuels. So that comes back again, uh, as, uh, as was the case in COP26. Um, but it's a conscien consciousness that we should be talking about wind and solar and, and hydroelectric, those three sources of renewables uh, as a transition away. So to be very candid about it and realistic, fossil fuels aren't going away. Um, so the question is how do we manage them so they don't contribute to the problem to a point at which that the problem is uh, beyond our uh, managing control. And that really, I think, is beginning to become the consciousness of businesses, governments, NGOs, uh, as to the realities uh, of uh, business and energy uh, consumption. 
All right, so we've got these two pillars of sustainability. And one of the things I really, really want to uh, present to you uh, this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are, is we've got a real language challenge. And because there is no central depository, there is no central academic source, there's no central, if you will, authority that determines the definition of words. And when you're in this new space, words are really powerful because words turn into standards and standards turn into regulations. And of course, if we, we are not talking about the same thing because our understanding of language is different, it really, really creates a problem. So we've got these two pillars of sustainability, CSR, corporate social responsibility, and ESG, environment. On my, on my left, it's more qualitative and more about the internal governance operations of or responsibilities of companies. And one of the significant ones was um, the commitment that so many had made uh, to diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of their HR uh, commitments to bring in marginal groups, uh, to bring in people who have not had the same opportunities. Uh, so doing good and avoiding bad are two terms you, you very often hear in conjunction with CSR. ESG is more about the external, uh, about measurable approaches to uh, financial metrics, uh, environmental performance measurements, and um, these two tend to go back and forth in terms of the intensity of, of conversations and of commitments. Now, one of the things I'd like to bring up is again, to show how difficult it is to maintain a steady course of policy. CSR uh, and it's one of its major, major uh, pillars is DEI. Again, diversity, equity, and um, inclusion. And it has been under incredible, incredible attack. Um, it's been politicized, to be frank about it. And um, whether it's good or it's bad, I'm not here to judge. My, my responsibility to you is to describe what's happened and to indicate how these things then create problems as to what policy is and what the trends are likely to be. And you as a business person, should you be embracing or should you not be embracing a particular standard? So what's happened over the last six or eight months is co companies such as Ford Motor Company, Harley Davidson, um, John Deere, Tractor Supply, um, even Google and Meta have downsized. The other ones have eliminated divisions, literally laid people off or let them go and they had pretty big uh, divisions inside HR that were DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion divisions with pretty substantial budgets. But there has been a very, very dramatic reaction uh, to this part of sustainability. And uh, it's very difficult to know where it's going uh, at, at this point in time, but there's definitely been a reduction in, in this uh, commitment. All right, so if we continue on this uh, on this whole conversation, defining sustainability enables you to define sustainability goals. There is no Webster's Sustainability Dictionary. I always say we need a Webster's Sustainability Dictionary um, so we know what we're talking about. Um, we've got a very simple uh, UN definition of sustainability, but it doesn't tell us the details and the devil is always in the details. But at least it's a start. Sustainable development means that we meet the needs of the present generation, but we don't compromise in doing that, the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, social needs, economic needs, psychological needs, whatever, however we want to define it. And that however and whatever is part of the challenge, as you see, in terms of which of the two are we going to focus on, CSR, ESG. So what has happened, and this is again, simply by market dynamics, there's no central authority who determines or which determines this. You'll see the bottom of this screen, ESG has eclipsed CSR as the prevalent call letters for sustainability. So they're almost 
used interchangeably. Sustainability is often used also as a concept, an overriding umbrella under which ESG and CSR find themselves. So if we look, however, at the fact that do we have clarity now? Well, take a look at this chart. <laughs> what's right and what's wrong with this chart? The people who have designed it, and this is an engineering group, and you know, perfectly legitimate to do this. What is ESG? And the subset says, actually, it's pretty simple. Well, frankly, it's not pretty simple. Look at this. They've designed it as corporate social responsibility plus sustainability equals ESG. So we're back to more confusion. I'm saying to you very, very simply, sustainability is, uh, again, um, the, the general, all right, headline. And CSR and ESG are two subsets. And ESG has become quite dominant. We're going to see later on in this presentation that even ESG as a, as a concept has gone uh, under the microscope of, uh, <clears throat> of businesses. And um, they're beginning to call everything sustainability because there's again pushback, not only on CSR, but on ESG because of the word environmental. So we, we've got this turmoil going on in, 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 in terms of language. And later on, we're going to see in the presentation that even the Securities and Exchange Commission, that regulatory agency has had to basically backstep because of the fervor against what things are called and then how you've set standards uh, using that language. So we are in turmoil, we are not in a set place. And again, we do need a Webster's Sustainability Dictionary, or we need a single source, if you will, that tells us what it's all about. All right, the next question I'd like to talk about is the uh, sustainability uh, of con consumer. One of the things that we hear about is most consumers are not committed to sustainable practices. The second, uh, almost uh, what's become uh, a given is those committed are young consumers. Uh, so it's, you know, basically <clears throat> generation uh, Z and generation X and not the Y and the boomers and people like that. So there are not enough critical mass for change and therefore we can back off from investing significantly in uh, what's needed to arrest crime, uh, climate change. The third is most countries are not concerned unless they are very industrialized. And then the last is sustainable products are too expensive for most consumers. Um, we have a, ba a, a Bain study here, and I think probably most of you know Bain, you know, very reputable. And I will send this to you as well, rather than run it here. But what I'm going to uh, detail right now is drawn from the Bain study. They did a global survey of over 30,000 consumers in uh, at least uh, 12 or 15 major geopolitical markets. And what was the conclusion of the study? First of all, number one, most consumers are committed to sustainable practices. Very, very clearly. And I'm going to show you some charts in a moment, which confirms that. Second of all, those committed are not simply the young generations. Uh, there are some differences, yes, in percentage or intensity of commitment, but there's no doubt that the commitment is across the board. This is really, really important because the kinds of monies that are needed to be able to build the kinds of technologies to wrestle this uh, challenge to the ground really requires trillions, maybe three or four trillions of dollars a year has been one of the estimates. But where is that money going to come from? The younger generations have their challenges with getting great jobs, building, if you will, a portfolio, buying a house, paying for college. They're not in the position to invest <clears throat> in the kind of equities or bonds and, and what have you. We have a section in 
couple of weeks on, on green bonds and, and social bonds. But there are, in terms of the older generations, absolutely that kind of um, disposable income in the trillions because they've had the time to uh, accumulate that kind of wealth. So the good news uh, is not that the younger consumer is the only uh, person. Uh, the good news is not that the younger consumer uh, um, is not interested. Of course they are. But the really good news is sections of the demographic map in the older cohorts are definitely interested and they have the money to make a difference. And that is a really critical point. The third uh, finding that the Bain study came up with is that most countries are concerned. And this is critical for those of you who are going to global markets, uh, whether they're in South America, whether they're in the Pacific, whether they're <clears throat> in Eastern Europe, uh, wherever they may be. Um, the, the key really is the nature of the specific priorities that both the governments and the consumer groups have. And I'm gonna show you some charts where you see uh, the, um, the UN, you know, 17 types of, of goals, definitely being part of a whole panoramic set of markets. And they differ as to which of the goals are most important. Why? It depends, again, on the social context, the political context, and uh, of course, the climate context in which these countries meet climate change. And in some instances, you're going to see the most important thing is a question of poverty or water, yes? Uh, oh, and uh, flooding, things that we, for example, in the West might find less of a question or challenge. So uh, that's really, I think, part of what we want to think about when we go to market. The strategy has to be based on the particularities of the marketplace not some general aspiration as to what you'd like to achieve in terms of climate uh, change uh, and uh, your own product uh, distribution. And finally, and this is of course, almost the default that people who wanna shut down a lot of climate change progress go to. They'll say, oh, it's too expensive. Consumers don't wanna pay for it. The data shows just the opposite. Um, there's always going to be a cluster of people who are going to pay no matter what the price. And then there's always going to be a cluster of consumers that don't want to pay no matter how low the price. So those two extremes do not define or create a market. The bell-shaped curve is critical. And once we are able to identify the various types of specif specificities in terms of the type of consumers, meaning we have to have a segmentation model inside the bell-shaped curve. But the bell-shaped curve gives us critical mass, but that mass has to be segmented. And we just can't homogenize the distinctions in taste, again, locality, experience, uh, education, and things of that nature. And I'm gonna to come to those dynamics uh, in a moment. So only the most, there's no such thing as the average consumer. That's, that's, I think, really, really important. And we get trapped by this. We really do, because we're looking for scale, and that's totally understandable from a business perspective. But looking for scale and averaging out differences that are significant are not going to help your marketing and your business distribution and the final outcome. So... Again, only the most passionate consumers make sustainability their sole purchasing uh, criteria. And most base things on a combination. And here's some of the reasons. So what you really need to do is, um, is to strategically align your uh, sustainability with the key purchase criteria of the category without forcing a trade-off. Why are people buying this particular product? All right. And then is there a sustainability feature that can complement the purchase criteria of the product or the service itself? 
And I think that's really critical. You don't have to change your business model, but you have to see what the alignment, how does sustainability inform the purpose criteria so they're compatible? So how do we find this out? Well, again, number four, design segmentation models based on psychological, behavioral data, very important. You're going to have to do, or you can purchase uh, some research. Um, the main research, for example, is an example, uh, but there's others. There's Mintel, for example. There's Kantar, for example. Um, we know <clears throat> McKinsey, for example. All four of those are more than reputable. They're the standard, the gold standard in the survey industry in this space. So, uh, and you might be able to, if if you have the wherewithal internally, is do some of this yourself. Um, we have to look at the priorities and the different regional climate impacts and government policies as well as the individual consumer segments. And I, I just can't really stress that enough. There's no average uh, consumer and you'd be wasting your money and, and if you will go to if you go to market with that strategy. So here's a simple example of, of something that um, is a US consumer sustainability segmentation model. Uh, this particular model through research has identified eight different types. And again, this is definitely a psycho um, social behavioral model. And it indicates the degrees to which they are more or less likely to embrace segmentation. So the way in which you market can't be a uniform message or image uh, or modes of uh, marketing messaging. It has to be based on something that you feel comfortable with, which is then confirmed by the kind of response you get from the model in terms of sales, in terms of interest, in terms of feedback. But you'll see there are some in this model that are very difficult to reach and probably should not be the focal points of your marketing strategy. And then there are others which are fundamentally low hanging fruit, so to speak, who are anxious and, and open to well-informed, act, actively uh, pursued, um, eco-friendly uh, products and services. By the way, let's be careful about that word because that's being challenged by some of the regulatory agencies, but this is the model that um, perhaps has been uh, put together without that consideration, but that's okay. As long as we understand that may be a few challenges around some language, again, we'll get to that a little more uh, later on. All right, so let's keep moving through this. Here's the, Kantar has done some interesting work as I pointed out earlier. And here's a country by country market variations. So again, getting more granular. You might talk about South America, Argentina. You may talk about uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the Pacific, Australia, but it's great to be able to get if you're marketing in the country, what's going on there? What is really the fundamental driving, if you will, current? And uh, these are some that Cantar has identified. Uh, for example, in Argentina, they're really, really starting to do a lot of work in regenerative uh, agriculture, lots of work. And again, with the pampas and what have you, lots of land that needs to be regenerated. It tells you a little bit about perhaps what's a lead, a suggestion as to what you need to know about to enter that market. And the rest of these, again, are attempts to uh, create a, a very focused uh, kind of understanding of the major considerations that are dominating the thinking and the receptivity, and this is what's important, of the market as you uh, move uh, toward that. So for example, you go to Singapore, goes with green investment plan. Singapore is just really on top of the whole idea of, of green investment, You know whether it's impact investing, green bonds, social bonds, uh, it's you know very very strong as you probably know uh, financial market, and it has the wherewithal to move um, the whole sustainability effort 
into the financial realm and move towards solutions that are financially driven. So this is just um, a, a way to understand that um, moving from a global areas, uh, such as, uh, if you will, uh, Europe, you know, right in South America, uh, is a good beginning, but not enough. You want to drill down if you have a particular country that's your primary market target into some as to what's really the conversation all about that's unique to the culture, because then you'll know more about what's going to motivate the um, the consumers. All righty, so here's an example of what I mean. If you take a look at uh, this sustainability um, this sustainability chart, um, what's so interesting is that you you have uh, again, and notice the colors and notice the references, air pollution, water pollution, poverty and hunger. You have the UN, if you will, social and environmental uh, sustainability goals here. Even the colorations are from the UN. So the UN does have and serves a purpose as a guiding framework. But you've got air pollution in China in number one, and you have poverty and hunger in Thailand as number one, and Vietnam it's water pollution. So you get very, very specific concerns that consumers have. And again, this is based on research in these areas. Um, and uh, it's really important because these are gradations of intensity of commitment. And it tells you that if you do have a product or service that has a solution in that particular intense one, two, three market, well, that should be probably a place that you look to do business in as soon as you can. But also, it's important to get some scale. So if you go down below, take a look at Indonesia, the Philippines, and Thailand. If you look at number one in each of those um, geographic nation state markets, they're all poverty and hunger, poverty and hunger. So there's a regional possibility of scalability. And you can do that with second or third tiers in all the other markets as well. So you can get a uh, a something more than just a, a national entry marketing strategy when you find the commonalities in a region that enable you perhaps to scale given whatever again your product or service solution is but again it should be driven not only by what you can do but the degree to which what you can do is an intense issue in that market and and this is critical it has to be done in a way that is culturally sensitive or culturally responsive. What's the key conversations that are animating and concerning the consumers in those marketplaces? So this is a great chart, I believe, because it gives you the variation, but gives you the specificity for a focal point in terms of marketing, uh, marketing strategies. All right, so the solution. And this is a this is a mantra that I I've really recited in my own practice um, as as a marketing strategist and a consultant. I always try to say, hey, let's make the consumer the center of your strategy. It isn't the product. It isn't the service. That is, let's assume that your product or service is going to solve the problem. So the question is, how do you communicate that solution to the customer? So it isn't the product or service. That's, that's a given. You know what you're doing. You have the market credibility. You have the technical and personal and financial wherewithal. Now, how do you make the consumer the center? Well, your marketing messaging, your marketing imaging, all right? Your marketing conversation has to be toned to the culture of that consumer. So no matter the market, and here's again the subset. Those issues closer to home will always take precedence. And that's why we saw the differences in terms of water pollution in one place, poverty in another in terms of market. Um, the second part is there are issues that we, for example, uh, in the States really don't think much about, but are really critical. Water pollution in Vietnam, poverty and hunger in the Philippines, uh, lack of health care and vaccinations in Malaysia. All right, so we, we need to, as I said earlier, be very specific sometimes when we go through this. And I'll get right down to the bottom. So, for example, in developing Asia, 
firsthand experience of environmental issues and fundamental social deficiencies are a reality. How can your brand tackle a community problem, answer that problem, and the consumers will see the real value of your brand and you will gain traction. So it, it really gets down to the community and saying, you know, what's being said, what's being spoken about. Um, that's where the marketing strategy begins and that's where the success and from which the success will emanate. All right, so let's start taking a look at um, some of the ways in which you have to tone and create your marketing messages and your hang tags and your labels and your um, what you post on, on TikTok or Facebook uh, or on Instagram. In other words, all of your marketing communications, all of your conversations, what do you say on TikTok? What images do you bring to the market? Are subject more and more to regulatory frameworks that have with them uh, not only very specific guardrails, but very intensive fines if you violate and very intensive, if you will, restrictions if you don't comply. Um, there is even a conversation right now going on in the EU that will <laughs> could lead to uh, as much as a 5%, um, if you will, penalty of revenues for people who violate certain very critical uh, climate uh, control measure, measures by the way in which they uh, market uh, their conversation. That is greenwashing. Serious. The truth value communications, right? Percent tax on violations. And uh, we're going to take a look a little bit at that. We have that in another section, another module. But um, I think it's important now uh, that we um, continue to just take an overview here rather than drill down. So, um, it's important, and here's a caveat. Please remember that a brand is bound by the regulations in markets where they do business, irrespective of where the business is registered. So for us in the US, many businesses do it, for example, in the UK or in, in the EU. Well, in both those markets, the regulations are much, much more demanding than in the US. Both of those regulatory cultures are, are very much different than what we, no, not very much, that's probably, uh, I, well, they, they would appear to be from a business point of view, because what they demand is proactive kinds of marketing and very, very restrictive kinds of language and imaging and symbolism. The SEC, as well uh, as the major regulatory agencies uh, are really very often working under a less restrictive uh, set of standards. So um, whether you do business in the EU or not, we strongly recommend that you stay in touch with EU um, both uh, rules, which are not necessarily uh, as yet uh, regulations, but um, also the FTC green guides, for example, which aren't regulations, but tell you the direction where you're going in terms of regulatory responsibility that businesses have. So um, I think it's it's critical that um, you've got to see what the agencies are thinking and or proposing. So even if they're not regulations, their rules or their guides, and the language again is variable depending on whether it's the UK or the FTC or the EU. But again, rules and guides are not regulations, but, <laughs> You've got to read very carefully to make sure you're you're not uh, misreading uh, the uh, the nature of the um, of the standard that that's being proposed. So uh, I think of it as a as, as staying in touch with an early warning system, an early late system, and you can engage the agencies. This is really critical. Um, the agencies all have to have advance notices before they translate. Uh, what is a rule or a guide uh, into a regulation or law. 
And that's your chance to write or uh, to uh, attend a meeting if it's open and make your claim. And this is done in, in the US quite a lot. And in fact, we see this SEC and the FTC pulling back on proposals because of public response. So staying in touch is important. You do have the ability to affect what the final regulatory framework will look like, but you've got to be in touch. So I, what I put at the bottom here is the relevant websites and you can see them. And, and again, uh, this whole, by the way, a presentation will be available. Uh, and if you, if you don't take a snapshot now, it's okay because you'll be able to uh, get them later. But you, you should be visiting these certainly once a month. And if there's something that's definitely a hot item that's in conversation, that's in the trade, uh, if you will, um, communications, perhaps even uh, visiting every week or two weeks. All right, so let's take an overview. How does the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, see things? Well, it takes the position that before a general claim of an environmental benefit is made, number one, marketeers should have reliable scientific evidence to support carbon offset claims or other claims that you make uh, in uh, your uh, marketing communications uh, to the public. Now, what are reliable scientific communications or evidence? Well, they could come from certification agencies. They could come from research that was done that's, re that's recognized as a source of consequence. Uh, it could be secondary information that you have gathered uh, that's parallel to your claim. But you've got to have something, and reliable is the key word. It's the operative word. You simply can't say, well, this is scientific. But it has to be something, and again, most generally something that comes and has been determined from outside your own organization. Second of all, if you make a claim of an environmental benefit, the marketeers may must have made some analytics about trade-offs. So for example, if it costs more energy to achieve the benefit, the question is, is the benefit a, a viable return on investment if it's costing you more energy? Um, this is a key issue as well. And then finally, the marketeer must be ready to prove that there's no negative environmental impact created during the product's life cycle. Well, this is a huge, huge responsibility. I mean, think about this for a moment. The product's life cycle. Do you have to actually track your product, whether it's a technical, technological product or a passion product? all the way through to the consumer's closet and then to what the consumer does with that? That is, where does the responsibility of the brand and the corporation end when you have such a wide open phrase as the product's life cycle? Now, in a lot of the uh, uh, conversations around supply chains and uh, you know upstream and downstream, there is uh, more and more about looking at downstream, that is the distribution, the retail, the sales, the shipping, that is how does it get to market and what happens once it's in the market. Because we know from the impact of, especially in the fashion space, for example, there is huge, huge uh, uh, <clears throat> product life cycle issues uh, in terms of fast fashion, and in terms of um, the fact that there is uh, very, very, very short lives and there are very, very large, if you will, um, <laughs> actual uh, mountains of products that uh, are, are not uh, recycled. So we, we've got to understand what this term means, how far the responsibility is drawn, and it hasn't been determined by the FTC. And these are the kinds of issues that you need to uh, uh, basically contribute your own worldview on from your own business pr perspective. All right, so let's get a little more specific. Claiming green or made with recycled content may be deceptive. You may be subject to greenwashing and to fines 
if the environmental costs, great, as I say, of recycle content outweigh the environmental benefits. Um, certifications, as I mentioned earlier, if you're going to talk about science, you've got to talk about a certification agency that's done the science. So um, if you're going to make a claim and you're using a seal or a certification, you really have to indicate the specific environmental benefit. You can't, you simply can't say, we support, uh, if you will, agency X or agency Y. What is it that you are doing? The mere putting of a seal or a certification on your website is insufficient. And it might be a greenwashing violation. Number three, if you say that something you have produced is made with renewable energy, you have to specify the source of renewable energy and listen again, clearly and prominently. What does clearly and prominently mean? Well, it can't be in such small print that you can't read it. But again, the FTC doesn't say that. But guess what? The EU does say that. Standards which are much more demanding. But you have to say whether it's wind or it's solar energy, you simply can't say this product made with renewable energy. You have to specify what type. And fundamentally, it can be wind, solar energy, hydroelectric. Uh, those are certainly renewables. And then finally, what is biodegradable? I mean, you see marketing phrases and claims. And this is one that's used all over. All right, you can't make an unqualified degradable claim unless you can prove that the entire product or package will completely break down and return to nature within a reasonably short period of time. And here's, again, one of those phrases that has a great deal of variability to them. Who defines this? Well, they say a reasonably short period of time for the decomposition of solid waste, one year. But items destined for landfills and facilities sometimes degrade within a year, but sometimes do not. Why? Because they're made with components that haven't been clearly identified. And the overall, the overall garment or the overall instrument is made with biodegradable, uh, if you will, components. But there could be parts within it that have not been clearly labeled or discerned, which are not. And again, that would put you in a position uh, of not meeting, uh, if you will, the, uh, the claim with directness and honesty. Alrighty. So <laughs> let's get into um, something that I think is, is probably top of mind with some of you who are watching and listening today. And that is the whole question of what the SEC is proposing to clarify this so-called names rule. Uh, again, we began uh, the session uh, at 12 o'clock with this whole challenge about language. And we're going to conclude it with a similar kind of challenge because it permeates and pervades this entire challenge we have of getting the language right, because the language simply isn't simply words and concepts. The words and concepts become standards, and the standards become regulations, and the regulations become law. And again, uh, the, the violations carry some very, very significant penalties. Okay, so the, the current names rule says that if a fund uh, if um, uh, if a uh, a fund's name, uh, an equity fund or investment fund, suggests it's focused on a particular class of investment, such as government bonds, then at least 80% of its assets must be in that class. Well, how do you determine uh, that? Does it have to be, if you have 10, so you have to have eight? Does it have to be everything inside or can it simply be eight, eight types? So that raise some issues of category versus, if you will, details. Um, but uh, they, they've kind of you know, danced around that and said, well, 
that presupposes that there's such a thing as an ESG uh, instrument. Well, unless it is clearly a social bond, yes, or a um, green bond or something of that nature, um, it's really not, uh, I, I think, something that can be classified as a sustainability asset. So that would clear up. But very often, the whole argument is that if it can do some good in the sustainability space, then it is a sustainability investment. But that presupposes that someone has gone out and measured the impact. And we all agree that it's impact. So it isn't a class of investment that has clarity as to its effectiveness and therefore should really be called what it's claimed to be called an ESG sustainability asset, unless it can do something. <laughs> so any fund name with terms suggesting that um, would have to have particular, they'd have to clearly define that term and then ensure that that definition is, is adhered to. Um, all right, publicly traded companies must also, the SEC is proposing, is to close, disclose how climate change affects their business? How does the risk affect the business? And, and this is really where there are tremendous pushbacks because what does it mean in a fund whose marketing says it's sustainable or green or ESG? Uh, some of the products may be, some of the products may not be, but you can't make that claim as a blanket claim anymore. So uh, this is a real, uh, a real issue. And <laughs> What's happened is uh, the traders and, uh, if you will, the uh, brokers have, have pushed back on this. And they push back to the extent that they no longer refer to anything that has to do uh, with um, uh, sustainability and investment. The, the call that is ESG and no longer reference. Why? Because it has environmental. They now simply describe things as sustainable with sustainability. And I mean, it's almost come down to that kind of consciousness, you know, the discomfort with the very, very call letters. Um, so th th this goes uh, to a, a court as well uh, as to whether or not the general name rule should be in effect. And most of the companies that are now uh, suing, which they've done, they've sued the SEC, this is in court, and we're waiting to see uh, what the outcome of this uh, will look like. But um, part of, of what this is all about, what is called the materiality rule. The SEC has argued that an investor, any, you know, myself, you, any investor should really have sufficient evidence that meets the test of materiality meaning it is deep enough, significant enough, confirmed enough that it is useful and informs them sufficiently so they have guidelines on sustainability investments that the, any normal investor has a right to have. There's the pushback, the materiality, if you will, stand it. So um, we're in court, we're gonna see where all this takes it, but right now the SEC has taken a step backwards. And here's the most recent step backwards. September the 14th, just what, a week or so ago, they have the director of the SEC disbanded the SEC's internal greenwashing unit. Disbanded it. Didn't put it on hold. Didn't put it on leave. Disbanded it. And that was the uh, basic uh, unit that investigated marketing, communications, you know, when you send out a prospectus from uh, from an investment house, you know, what's, where it's in, what's the language? Is it meeting the standards? And the statement by the director, I, I think is, is qualified. We're happy with where we're at, but if greenwashing rises to a level that we consider to be uh, destructive of consumer interests, we will return to reviewing the need for the unit. That's fundamentally the unit is closed forever. And, you know, it's kind of what public speak, I think. So this is, you know, quite a, 
dramatic uh, change and setback. But again, it shows what happens and it shows the power of consumer opinion when you follow the guidelines that are being proposed in the FTC uh, or in the SEC and push back if you think they're offensive to your business interests. You have a right to do that. All right, so we can conclude on this note, just some general rules by the EU. And again, the EU is, is really uh, working on a different uh, ethical standard. If to some extent the in the US it's, you know, don't harm others, in the EU, EU is you have a responsibility to do good to others. So, you know, it's the golden rule reversed in one place and what affirmed in the other place. Um, and, and that makes a huge difference in how uh, expansive the regulatory rules are. So in the EU, EU, there is this consumer rights directive and it is the consumer's right to know, for example, how long a product is designed to last and if it can be repaired, amazing. Producers would be obligated to inform consumers about the guaranteed durability of products. You can't say made to last. Well, how long? And so the commission explains that sellers must inform consumers when no information uh, uh, is provided by the pr producer. And then uh, the commission suggests that the seller must provide relevant information if there's a repairability score. I don't know where that would come from, but obviously that's possible. We don't have that here, but that is emerging in certain markets in the EU. So the availability of spark spare parts or a repair manual. Well, for example, would that include a sewing kit on a shirt? Is that uh, how uh, a, a, an apparel uh, product uh, would fulfill? And then how do you sew the button on? I guess so. I mean, I would think so. But to some extent, uh, there are buttons on sh shirts right now, except they don't tell you how to sew it on and it comes off. But under this guideline, there'd be that obligation. So this is very close to becoming, if not at this point, I believe it will become part of the EU Commission's, not guidelines, uh, not, uh, if you will, uh, suggestions, but uh, actually consumer rights. So the producers and the sellers will decide how best to provide the information on durability repairs and updates to the consumer. And what this, this does in effect is to make the retailer now responsible as well uh, as the producer of the product or service to be involved in the durability compensation. There are other EU regulations that are much more comprehensive than what we do here, but obviously you can see that this is a different uh, consciousness. Well, it is one o'clock. Uh, I am uh, basically completing my, my presentation and I am uh, open to questions that you might have and would be delighted to uh, feel them uh, if you have them. Okay, are we... Anybody? Let's see what we have to get here, I think. Any Q&A on here? Okay, there doesn't seem to be any open questions there. Maybe they're in the chat box, no? All righty. Okay, any questions from anyone? Well, we had uh, five uh, participants. Are they still with us? I'll wait a few moments.
Okay, no more questions. So I think that we can end the webinar. Okay. So thank you everyone for attending and see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.